On July 19, 1977, the world teacher, the Christ Maitreya, head of the spiritual hierarchy, emerged from his ancient retreat and is now in the modern world. With his disciples, the masters of the wisdom, he will inaugurate the new age of synthesis and brotherhood. Good morning and welcome to our World Teacher Programme on Wellington's Access Radio 106.1 FM presented by Teresa and David on behalf of Share International New Zealand. Today and for the next three programmes we'll be presenting the audio version of Benjamin Krem's public lecture in New York City in 2001. If you visit YouTube, type Share International into the search box and then select Playlists. You'll find a selection of interviews and lectures featuring Mr. Krem. They're educational, entertaining and well worth a watch. Mr. Krem begins our first segment with an introduction to the reappearance of the world teacher for all humanity. He talks about humanity's elder brothers who they are and why they have returned. He discusses Jesus as the teacher for the age of Pisces, hence the fish as the symbol of the early Christian churches, and Maitreya, world teacher for the new age of Aquarius. Benjamin Krem then explains what will happen on the day of declaration when, simultaneously, all humanity will hear Maitreya's words in their own language. It is with great pleasure that I welcome Mr. Benjamin Krem. Good evening, everyone. We are about to open our eyes and minds to such knowledge, such happenings that if I could recount them all, not only would you find it difficult to believe, you would find it difficult to comprehend, to take in. The changes will be so great between now 2001, and say the next 25 years, you will feel you are living, if you are young enough to continue in that time, you are living in a new world, a new and different planet. Well, it will be the same planet, but transformed. And transformed, I suggest, because of the entry now into our life of those elder brothers of humanity who have simply gone ahead of us in evolution, who have reached the end of the evolutionary journey of this planet and who have nowhere else to go, it would seem. You can only go to the end and then you have a decision. You go on to higher planets, maybe a higher solar system, but many of these men who have reached that point of decision, luckily for us, elect to remain on earth and help to oversee the evolution of the rest of us and the lower kingdoms. And this group, it's a very large group, form the inner government, as it were, of the planet. They are the custodians of the evolutionary plan of planet Earth. Every planet has an ensouling entity or God, a Logos. And the Logos, that ensouling entity, the heavenly man who ensouls the planet, has plans for it. Otherwise he wouldn't bother to ensoul it. He has plans for its evolution and these plans involve the human kingdom, the lower kingdoms, the higher kingdoms, 
and all the vast collection of, of different forms of manifestation which his imagination, his knowledge and his creativity brings into play on, on the planet. As far as this planet is concerned, our Logos, our heavenly man, has a very specific plan of evolution and the masters of wisdom, as they're called, those elder brothers of humanity, are those who handle, because they're the only ones who know about it, handle the, the plan, the evolution which is specific. Most people, I think, know nothing about the plan of evolution. They don't know that things proceed according to a plan, but they do, very much so. The plan is not a set of blueprints which have to be followed exactly. It's a very creative plan. It grows from moment to moment as humanity evolves, so humanity enters more and more consciously into the nature of the plan and of his or her part in that plan. That's one of the beauties of evolution. You evolve. You don't stay at the same point. You evolve. You become better, more evolved. You become wiser. You become a better person in the sense of more creative, more able to handle the niceties, the difficulties of the plan, and to help to put that plan into effect. And so, behind the scenes of our life, there has been from the beginning of time on planet Earth a structure which is broadly generally known as the esoteric or spiritual hierarchy of planet Earth. That hierarchy is made up of those members of the human kingdom who have evolved to a point where they need no further evolution. They are achieved, they are adepts, they are masters of wisdom, and some of them, the very highest of them, are called Lords of Compassion. The head and leader of that group of perfected men the Masters of Wisdom, is the Lord Maitreya. He is one of the three Lords of Compassion. And he embodies in his being what we call the Christ Principle, the energy of love. He is the Lord of love. And 2,000 years ago, he did what had happened over and over again. It was the normal way for the presentation of the teacher to the world. He overshadowed, as it's called, his consciousness, came into the consciousness of Jesus for three years, from the baptism to the crucifixion. And during these three years, people saw Jesus, but they saw Jesus as the Christ. The Christ consciousness, embodied by the Lord Maitreya, manifested through Jesus. Jesus became the observer of what happened. Sometimes the consciousness of Maitreya alone was in that body of Jesus. Sometimes the consciousness of Jesus was in that body alone. And sometimes the consciousness of Maitreya and the consciousness of Jesus were simultaneously in that body. And as I say, Jesus was the observer of everything that happened through him. But it was the consciousness of Maitreya who embodies the Christ principle and is the Christ of this planet who, which manifested through Jesus for these three years. Now, as I've said, Jesus is a very, very advanced master. He's a sixth degree initiate. As Jesus, he was a fourth degree initiate. He took that initiation on the cross and is now a sixth degree initiate, one of the closest workers, brothers, colleagues of Maitreya, the world teacher, and their 
practically, I would say, inseparable, and they work together all the time. And Jesus is one of the masters most evolved with this coming transformation of the earth. You're listening to the World Teacher Program on Wellington's Access Radio 106.1 FM. Benjamin Krem continues. Now we have the capacity to see Jesus again after 2,000 years. In the very near future you will see Jesus. I promise you, I'm not an evangelist. I'm not asking you to believe him or to, you know, give, it, give him your five dollars, your ten dollars, your fifty dollars, <laughs> put your hand on to the five dollars, ten dollars. No, I'm not asking you to do that. But I'm just suggesting to you, believe it or not, but you don't have to believe it. But you will see Jesus, now a master, no longer, you know, gentle Jesus, meek and mild. He's a master. He is a man of extraordinary, what shall I call it, capacity to love, to serve, wise as the hills, beautiful in every atom of his being, who is now living in the world, is living as near to you as Rome, Anybody going to Rome this year on vacation? Nobody going to Rome? Not that you would see him, <laughs> I hasten to add. <laughs> I've got his address here, but I'm not, <laughs> I'm not going to give it to you. Uh, no, I cannot. I mean, there's no way I could do that. But this great being, Jesus, who introduced so many extraordinary, marvelous ideas to the world 2,000 years ago, is one of these masters who are now coming back into the everyday world. And in a very short time, you will see Jesus as he is today, as a master of wisdom, one of that group who are returning to the world. Jesus, like all the other masters, has never left the world. He's not sitting up on the right hand of God up in heaven, as the Christian groups would have you believe. He's busy every single moment of the day, working, not sitting, working, and jogging. <laughs> No, he's not jogging. <laughs> but he could be jogging, you know. He works, he, works, he works very hard indeed. Every minute of every 24 hours. No sleep, no food, just plain work. But the work is a joy, of course. It's not, he has a capacity for joy, which if we had it, we would enjoy our lives so much better than we do. He is one of that group of masters who are returning now to the everyday world. For centuries, no, for thousands of years, for a hundred thousand years nearly, the masters have lived in the remote mountain and desert areas of the world, like the Himalaya, the Andes, the Rockies, the Carpathians, the Urals, the Gobi Desert and various other deserts. From there, they have beneficently overseen the evolution of the earth. They have make up the spiritual or esoteric hierarchy of this planet and they have worked almost exclusively through their disciples men and women in the world. Give me the name of any man or woman who has significantly affected our civilization, our culture, down through the ages, and you will have given me the name 
of an initiated disciple of one or other of the masters. People like Plato, Aristotle, like uh, Shakespeare, Leonardo, Michelangelo, Mozart, Beethoven, Bach, you name it, the great philosophers, the great theological people like Luther and, and uh, other great religious thinkers, the people like Einstein, scientists of all kinds. These are disciples, if they are of a certain evolution, a certain degree, disciples of the masters. And through them, the masters have worked. Some of the great world leaders, political leaders, have been conscious workers for the spiritual hierarchy. Knowing who they were, working, knowing the masters, working for the masters. In this way, the masters know the world better than anybody knows the world. And we're living in the world, and yet any master knows far more about the nature of life on earth, even though he is somewhat distant from it. He may be living in the Himalaya and the Andes and so on. There's a group of masters who elected to live more openly in southern India for the most part, and that southern Indian lodge is better known and uh, the sequence of masters who have lived there more openly. But the Trans-Himalayan Lodge and other parts of the world in the Andes and so on have been, as I say, practically unknown. I don't need to tell you, I think, that we are beginning a new age. We're just at the beginning of the Aquarian Age. This is the result of the movement of our solar system around the heavens in relation to the constellations of the zodiac. Our sun, with its system, makes such a journey which takes approximately 26, 25 to 26,000 years to complete. And so, again, approximately, it varies from cycle to cycle, Approximately every 2,150 years, our sun comes into an alignment with each of the constellations in turn. And when we are in that alignment, we say we are in the age of whatever is the age, the name of the constellation. For the last 2,150 years, we were in that alignment with the constellation Pisces. And the, the role of Jesus, or rather of Christ, through Jesus, was to inaugurate the age of Pisces. The early Christians knew, without any doubt, those around Jesus, his disciples knew that that was their role. Pisces, the symbol for Pisces is a fish, usually two fishes swimming in opposite directions, and that fish symbol dominates the whole of the Gospel story. At the end of the Gospel story is a very tiny, apparently insignificant little vignette, which is most interesting. Just before the end of Jesus' life, he sent the disciples into the town of Jerusalem and told them that there they would find a man carrying a pitcher of water on his shoulder. They were to follow the man and go to a house where he would go, and prepared the feast of the Passover on the top floor of the, of the house, which, of course, they did. In that apparently insignificant, insignificant little vignette, the Christ foreshadowed, the Christ in Jesus foreshadowed his future role as the teacher, the avatar, as they call him in the East, for the age of Aquarius, the man with a pitcher of water, of course, is the age-old symbol for Aquarius.
I believe that Maitreya will come forward very soon. He will first of all come on a major television network in this country, which will allow him to speak to millions of people, but not as Maitreya. He will not be called Maitreya. He will just be one of us, an ordinary man, but with extraordinary ideas. Then he will speak in Japan in the same way on television and then all the television networks of the world will want that man to come and speak until he becomes very well known and his people hearing about it will say, but that's sense, that is the only sensible thing I've heard this year. And they will join, they will join up and they will, they will he has got a flag, you know, which says freedom, justice, right relationship. And they will want to, that cause of freedom and justice for everybody. They will join. They will give him their allegiance. And that will grow and grow until so many that the nations of the world, the governors of the world, the politicians of the world, the Mr. Bushes of the world, will we'll say, okay, we give in. It's up to you people to do what you will. And you people will put to rights the world. That's how it will be. Then will come the day of declaration. When enough people have responded to his teaching and the Changes are beginning to take place. They will call on Maitreya to speak to the whole world. And he will come on television, linked together by satellite, so that everyone everywhere can see him. On that day, arranged in advance, of course, by media, you will be told to tune in at certain station, and you will see the face of this extraordinary being by now familiar. But this time he will not speak. He will not say a word. He is omniscient, omnipresent. He will come into telepathic rapport with every individual on the planet above the age of 14. And each of us will hear him inwardly in our own language, whatever it is. You will hear him in English, the French and French, the Russians and Russian, the Chinese and Chinese, the Polish and Polish, the Poles and Polish, and so on. Whatever is your language, that is what you will hear inside. He will talk about the level from which humanity has come, the great divine nature which is ours, and the fall which we have made into materialism. He will show a short history of the world, he will speak about the future, the extraordinary life which awaits, awaits us in the future when we have set to rights the world, when we have given up war as a means of settling problems and, and when all the people of the world are eating on a daily basis, when the food and the raw materials are being shared and a new life is possible for the world. He will introduce the fact of his group, the masters of the spiritual hierarchy. He will probably name a few of them, best known like Jesus. And, so on. and soon after that, one by one, they will introduce themselves. I don't mean on that same day, but soon after the day of declaration, one by one, the masters will be introduced to the world and we will know them and the world will begin to change. The masters will not do it, but they will advise, they will teach and we will do the work. Maitreya has said every brick, every stone of the new age must be built by human hands and by human hands it will be built. The temple, as he calls it, the new temple of life will be built by human hands and by the expansion of human consciousness, 
humanity will begin to create as the divine creates. We will become co-workers with God. Thank you very much. And that's it for today. Tune in to our next World Teacher Programme on Saturday the 21st of May at our usual time of 10am for Part 2 of Benjamin Krem's 2001 Lecture in New York when he'll be answering questions submitted by his live audience about Jesus and his relationship to Maitreya. If you would like more information on the emergence of the World Teacher and the Masters of Wisdom, we can highly recommend Benjamin Krem's book, The World Teacher for All Humanity, and its companion, The Awakening of Humanity. Both these books are available to read online or download free from the share-international.org website. However, if you prefer the paperback editions, you can order these books by phoning 04234-1133. That's 04234-1133. Or write to P.O. Box 9576 Wellington. We can also post or email our free of charge monthly newsletter, which contains a small selection of articles from the Share International magazine. You have been listening to Teresa and David on behalf of Share International New Zealand. Our phone number is 0636461101. That's 0636461101. You can listen again to this podcast and previous ones by visiting our new library at shareinternationalnewzealand.wordpress.com and click on the radio tab. <laughs>